You're doing this test incorrectly. In this video, I'll tell you about 11 extremely common mistakes people make with glucose meters or glucometers. This little device you're seeing right now, it's extremely important and very useful in diabetes treatment for monitoring blood sugar levels as it allows us to check blood sugar levels and capillary glucose levels. How do I know you're doing it wrong? If I don't know you, I can't know how you perform this test. I'm saying this because in over 10 years of diabetes experience, you know I'm an endocrinologist. Every patient I've explained these errors to has made at least one of them. This directly impacts your treatment because the doctor evaluates your levels. But if these levels are false or incorrectly measured, it can cause major problems for you potentially harming your health with very serious consequences. So it's crucial that you pay attention to these 11 mistakes, these 11 guidelines I'm going to share with you. And by the end of this video, if you use this little device, you'll probably admit, yes, I've made one of those mistakes, which I'm certain you have. It's very hard to be so definitive. Have you ever heard me make such a claim in any video? No, never. But on this topic, I speak with authority because many people lack the necessary information about this little device. To use it correctly, you need substantial information from specialists and many people simply don't have access to this knowledge. That's why I'm setting our like goal at 50,000 likes at the beginning of this video, because this helps the video get distributed so more people can access this content, okay? If you're not subscribed yet, consider subscribing and hitting the bell so you'll be notified whenever I post. So what are these 11 mistakes? The number one mistake with glucose meters is not using enough blood. Do you see this test strip here? There are many different types of strips. Some strips need more blood, others need less, but you always need to use enough. In this area here, for example, you need to completely fill this section with blood. If you use less blood than the strip requires, what can happen? You're probably thinking, oh, the device will show an error message, right? That's what you thought, isn't it? And the answer is that it can give an error. But if there's too little blood, the device might still take a reading, but it will give a false result, a falsely low reading. In other words, your glucose might be high, but by using too little blood, you could get a reading on the display that's falsely low. The actual glucose level is higher than what's showing there. This has many consequences in the short, medium, and long term. So first mistake, not using enough blood even if a number appears, okay? You need to check if you're filling the entire area required by each test strip. There are many validated glucose meters out there, each with its own test strips, okay? You know you can't mix strips using one device's strips in another meter. Everyone knows that but the error here is about the amount of blood. The second mistake when using a glucose meter is not drying your hands properly. Always before testing, your hands must be dry, even if just sweaty or wet, or if you washed but didn't dry well. Is your finger completely dry? This can compromise your test results. Many people think, oh no, it's just a little moisture, my hand is barely sweaty, nothing will happen. But yes, that small amount of liquid can greatly influence your test reading. So, always have completely dry hands before testing. Error number three is not respecting the timing for device measurements. And now you're probably thinking, but what's the right timing? How many times a day do I need to test? That depends on each individual case. Some people need to test once a day, others three times a day, and some need to test before and after meals. So this varies quite a bit, but when I say respect the timing, I mean the schedule your doctor prescribes. For example, when they ask you to test while fasting, this fast should preferably be between 8 and 12 hours or in the morning, okay? And after meals, the doctor may choose between 60 and 120 minutes. This is a common question, but why two hours after eating and why is that? Because scientific studies on diabetes, on good and bad values are conducted using this time frame. 
That's why we doctors recommend this timing, because the measurements are standardized. With these values, we can determine if your reading is good or bad. Got it? So that's the reason. It's not because it'll harm you or affect your body if done at the wrong time, but because it's the standard protocol. Now, do you think you should test two hours after your first bite when you start eating or two hours after your last bite? Think about it and answer me. What do you think? Most people said it's two hours after finishing the meal, correct? Completely wrong. The correct way is two hours after starting your meal, meaning after the first bite, because that's how the studies were conducted. So we need to respect these standards. That's why timing matters, okay? Have you ever made any of these three mistakes? Look, there's more. Other errors that are extremely common, even more frequent than the ones I just mentioned here. Mistake number four is performing the test with products on your hands, like creams. Oh, but I use it to moisturize my hands. Many creams interfere with glucose meters and your test results, so it's worth washing your hands first. You need to completely remove the cream, okay? I see many people in practice who apply those moisturizing creams. No, but my hands are very dry, it won't interfere. The answer is no, it can definitely interfere and give you a false result, okay? So you absolutely must remove any cream from your hands. Another common mistake, which I won't add to our list but is worth mentioning, is using alcohol instead of washing hands with soap and water. And since you may need to do this multiple times daily, if you're constantly applying alcohol to that area and rubbing, it can cause skin atrophy, right? It can damage your skin and finger, okay? So it's not worth using alcohol repeatedly. Occasionally you might say, I only have alcohol available, or they used alcohol before my medical appointment. This type of cleaning is actually common, okay? However, doing this several times a day at home can be harmful, okay? I won't consider this an error, as I mentioned before. The real mistake is applying creams to your hands, even well before testing. Obviously don't apply right before, but even applying earlier can affect results, okay? And so you need to remove these creams. Error number five is about where you're performing the test, okay? The test should be done on the side of your fingers. If you test here in the middle, which many people do because it's easier to press, right? The answer is no. First, the side of the finger, this part here is less innovated, so it hurts less and has more blood vessels, contrary to what many people think, okay? I'm not sure if that was clear, but it's here in this region here. Here, this is where you should test, not in the middle. Why? Because if you press too hard, besides hurting more and having fewer blood vessels, pressing too hard can release interstitial fluid. This can affect the test results, okay? So, not only is it uncomfortable for you, but you might get inaccurate results. This happens very frequently. I worked at a major diabetes center where many diabetics sat waiting about 30 to 50 patients waiting for the team. And I often observed the line, and many who did this, a little blood often came out. People were squeezing there, making faces to get the blood out. Has this happened to you, being like this? Making faces to get blood out? Well, squeezing your finger too much can alter the test, even if you get enough blood. But if you keep pressing too hard, the interstitial fluid I mentioned might come out. Okay, so, so that's mistake number five. Mistake number six is performing the glucose test with very cold hands. Many people have this characteristic, right? We have very cold hands. This is my case. I say this because whenever I greet people and extend my hand, they're often startled. Wow, your hand is so cold. So when I do the test, I need to warm it up, or if you live in a very cold place, like somewhere with snow, you'll often have cold hands, right? This is inevitable. And if you perform the test, you need to warm it up to normal temperature. And of course, not too hot. You don't need to put it in boiling water. Certainly not. But it can't be too cold with that icy hand. Okay, why? It can give a falsely low result. If your value is slightly higher, the result comes back lower. So with cold hands, you have to be careful about that. Number seven, and this one 
very few people know. Did you know that hemoglobin levels, hematocrit, red blood cells, if they're too high or too low, like in anemia or thick blood called polycythemia, can alter the result? Why? Because the proportion of red cells changes and often compromises the reading. So in cases of anemia, where we have fewer red blood cells, the result can be falsely elevated. It can give a result that's actually higher than it really is. For example, if you have anemia, the device might show a higher value than actual. Conversely, with polycythemia or thick blood with excess hemoglobin and red cells, readings can be false too, but in this case, the value will read falsely low. It will register a value that appears lower on the device than it actually is. Most devices can handle slightly altered hemoglobin levels within their measurement range. However, in cases of severe anemia, many devices cannot measure accurately. Did you know that? So you must ask your doctor if your values are compatible with your device, okay? This is an extremely common error. People with anemia or polycythemia using devices that can't measure accurately in these conditions, okay? So in some cases, you need to measure with the strip outside the device, then insert it, which can increase the reading the device detects. Often you may need to switch to a more specific device, okay? I know this information is hard to find in the instructions if you're not a doctor watching this video, but you need to ask your doctor about this, okay? If you have one of these conditions, bring your device and ask if it's working properly. Mistake number eight is not washing your hands well. If you have food residue, it can drastically alter your test results, giving much higher values. If you have glucose on your hands, like from orange juice or fruit you've eaten, even tiny amounts can interfere with your test, even showing HI readings, which means glucose is very high, okay? I've seen this happen many times. People who don't clean their hands after eating or test with dirty hands get very inaccurate results. This happens frequently, even with hospitalized patients doing regular monitoring, okay? Often they don't have easy access to a bathroom, so they start testing with dirty hands. Oh, I was just eating a cookie. I was just eating a fruit. It was just a banana. I was only eating an apple. Then you get residue on your hands, which greatly interferes with the results. So washing your hands thoroughly is extremely important. Mistake number nine, which many people make, I'm sure, is not using your glucose meter strategically. What does that mean? More than just checking your current value, you need to connect it with your activities. For example, today my value is higher, but I ate more bread than usual. Today my value increased, but I slept poorly. My value is lower today because I didn't eat my usual amount of rice. So you need to test and make connections with what you've done. The doctor will review those results, make an average, and get a general idea. But you need to know your body and test different foods. What happens when I eat a certain fruit? For me, does this fruit raise my levels more or less? There's an individual factor where we can understand general patterns, but individual responses can only be known through testing. We can predict this fruit probably won't raise levels much, but if you're diabetic, you need to test it to truly know your body and personalize your treatment. And you too, right? The doctor won't be with you 24 hours a day at home telling you what you should or shouldn't eat. So you need to take control, know your body, and use testing strategically to learn how the disease functions in your body. Mistake number 10, and this one is very interesting. Have you ever wondered if your glucometer is working properly? Is it calibrated correctly? Are the values being displayed actually accurate? Probably yes, right? Almost everyone asks me this question, and here we have two ways to solve this. The first way, did you know there's a control solution? What's that? You perform a test using this control solution. Each brand, each device has its own control solution. It's a small liquid you put on the test strip with an expected value. The test with this control solution should show the expected value listed on the box. Did you know that? Probably not. Nobody knew that. If you didn't know this, your like is already worth it. Just for learning about the control solution I mentioned. That's the first way, but less common. Why? Sometimes it's hard to find this control solution depending on where you live. Okay, so how will you know if your device is working, if what it's showing is actually true? 
The other way is to compare with a calibrated device, like when you go to a doctor's appointment, take yours along and test it at the same time. The results should be similar. There's a variation which I think is quite large, but it's the scientifically acceptable range. This variation is 15%, but if you're noticing large variations in readings, it's worth replacing your device. Okay, why? We've already seen how this can seriously harm your treatment. So if you suspect your results are off, or your device isn't working properly, or if it fell and might be miscalibrated, that happens frequently. Devices falling is very common. If you're getting unusual results when nothing else has changed, I suggest replacing your device. It's cheaper than buying the control solution I mentioned and better for your health too, right? Because inaccurate results can directly impact your treatment. So bring it with you to your appointment or to a pharmacy with testing devices or to a health center. There are many ways to check this, okay? Most package inserts suggest doing this check once a month, unless you don't suspect any issues, okay? Because honestly, errors in glucometers are extremely common. I know you'll ask, but which glucometer is best? All glucometers are validated. Each country has its own certification, so check if yours is on the list. Since there are many people worldwide, including myself, and I don't receive money from any device manufacturer, I always give the most honest advice possible. Check with the regulatory body for their list of approved devices. Not everything sold in pharmacies has this quality seal, okay? Many people think, if it's being sold, it must be quality. The answer is no. You should verify this. It's worth taking time to check if the device is validated. If you have any questions, drop the brand of your device in the comments and I'll respond. If I know the brand, I can tell you whether it's validated or not, okay? This helps and saves you time. Besides your device, also mention which country you're in. This is important for my research. I also like knowing your city. I'm from Porto Alegre. Share yours, your device, and let's move to error number 11. You know that little device for pricking your finger, the Lansing device? If you use a glucometer to measure glucose, you've definitely heard of it. And you've noticed it has different numbers on it, right? The smaller the number, the smaller the hole it makes in your finger. So thinner skin, like children who naturally have very thin skin, should use a smaller number. People with thicker skin, like those who work in fields or lift heavy weights, will need to use a higher number meaning they'll make a larger puncture because, as you've seen, smaller punctures can affect your test results. It's always important to check the expiration date of the test strips and also verify if your device requires a chip. When you get a vial of test strips, many have a chip inside. Do you know what it's for? That chip, you need to take it and insert it into your device. Some newer devices from the last few years, two, three years back or more, already have technology to read this, so you don't need to insert the chip. But if it comes with a chip, check your device version. You should remove the old chip to insert the one from the new strip box, okay? This can make a dramatic difference. And what are the normal readings on a glucometer? What's considered a good value? What's considered a bad value? How do we know if values are appropriate? I'll divide this into two groups. Diabetics and non-diabetics as non-diabetics can also use this test occasionally. How do you know if the value is good or not? For this, I'm going to show a table here to explain and you can see the fasting values before meals for both groups I mentioned, as well as 60 minutes after meals and 120 minutes after meals. Well, those were the 11 mistakes. During the video, I mentioned more errors, right? So I wanna know which of these did you make? Or have you made them before but stopped doing them now? It would be very satisfying to know that because of this video, you're performing the test correctly, avoiding errors and achieving better diabetes control since inaccurate measurements directly affect your health. Now you know how to do the test correctly. I'll leave a recommendation for you to watch next. It's a video where I discuss ways to control blood sugar levels. If you're diabetic or monitoring your blood sugar levels, it's essential that you watch this video to learn the best tips for keeping diabetes at optimal levels. If you click here, you'll be directed to that video. Take care. See you next time.